and I'm here in a lovely picturesque cemetery called Macquarie Park Cemetery and Crematorium. But I'm here for a very sad story. Imagine winning the lottery. All your bills are paid. Um, you can go on that dream holiday and it's very exciting. But in minutes, it turns into the biggest nightmare of your life. And this is the story today. Listen on. By 1960, the construction of the Sydney Opera House was becoming increasingly expensive. So the New South Wales government initiated numerous opera house lotteries to help raise the money. The 100,000 first prize pound, equivalent to 3.1 million in today's money, for Lottery 10 was won by Mr. Basil Thorne. In the lottery drawn on Wednesday, 1st of June 1960, as there was no real conception of the need for privacy for lottery winners at that time, and also for the sake of transparency, images and private details of lottery wins were published on the front pages of Sydney newspapers. It was also revealed that the prize would be paid by Thursday, 7th of July. The Thorne family consisted of Basil, his wife Frieda, his older daughter Cheryl, who had been institutionalised, son Graham, eight, and younger daughter Belinda, who was only three. They lived in a rental house in Bondi. Graham's morning routine was to wait at the corner of Wellington and O'Brien Streets, a walk of approximately 300 metres, where a family friend would pick him up and take him to school with her sons. On the morning of 7th of July, five weeks after the lottery win, Graham left for school as usual at 8.30 a.m. But when the family friend came to collect him at 8.40, he was nowhere to be seen. She then drove to the Thorns' home to find out if he was going to school. Surprise, Frieda confirmed that he where he was and wondered if he might have arrived at the school by some other means. So the family friend then drove to the school, the Scots College in Bellevue Hill, but returned upon finding out that he had not arrived. A concerned Frieda then called the police to report him missing. At 9.40 a.m., 70 minutes after Graham had left for school, a man with a noticeable foreign accent telephoned the Thorn household. Sergeant Larry O'Shea of Bondi Police had already arrived around 9.30 and took the telephone from Frieda, pretending to be the husband, Basil, who was out of town on business. The kidnapper stated, I have your boy. I want £25,000 before five o'clock this afternoon. I'm not fooling you. And if I don't get the money before five o'clock, I'll feed him to the sharks. O'Shea expressed doubt as to his ability to get hold of such a large sum of money, being unaware that the Thorns had recently won the lottery. The caller then said he would call back at five o'clock with more details and hung up. At 9.47pm, the kidnapper phoned again, but the telephone was answered by a different police officer, also pretending to be Basil who stalled for time to allow for a phone trace to happen. The kidnapper started to give instructions that the money was to be put in two paper bags, but then hung up abruptly without providing further instructions. The police became busy during the first day of the kidnapping, conducting a concentrated search near the Thorn House in Bondi. News of the kidnapping soon leaked to the Daily Mirror, and at 8.30 p.m. a public appeal was made on television from Bondi Police Station by New South Wales Police Commissioner Colin Delaney, then briefly an emotional Basil form. The next evening on Friday 8th of July, the focus of the investigation moved to Sydney's northeastern suburbs, where Thorne's school case was found near Seaforth. On the same day, 
a tip was received that a boy matching Thorne's description was seen with two men and a woman heading out of Pennant Hills, another suburb of Sydney. The owners of a petrol station there had reported that they saw a group with the boy pulling into the petrol station in a dark coloured vehicle at about 10pm on the 7th of July. The owners had described the vehicle as a dark coloured Dodge type sedan with the number plate on the front missing. The group purchased fuel and as the group's vehicle left, the owners managed to cite the rear number plate. When the vehicle was spotted by an off-duty police officer the following day, it sped off. Checks revealed that the number was registered to a different vehicle. On the 11th of July, Graham's school cap and the contents of his case were found nearby. Soon after the discovery, an official reward of £5,000 was declared and another 15000 was offered by two newspapers, leading to a number of hoax calls. Investigators, and with the collaboration of Sydney's underworld, followed other pieces of evidence. Some weeks before the kidnapping on Tuesday the 14th of June, a foreign man acting as an investigator had called at the Thorns residence seeking a Mr Borgnor and also asking Frieda Thorne to confirm their as yet unlisted telephone number. A similar looking man had also been seen numerous times by multiple witnesses in the park opposite the house. Also at 8.20 a.m. on the morning of the kidnapping, some witnesses had seen a blue 1955 Ford Custom Line double parked on the corner of Francis and Wellington Streets near where Graham was usually picked up. Investigators checking more than 270,000 registration records established that there was 5,000 vehicles matching this general description. On Tuesday the 16th of August, nearly six weeks after the kidnapping and only 1.5 kilometres from where the school case was found, the worst was discovered. Graham's body was hidden on vacant land and in a place called Grandview Grove in Seaforth in Sydney and identified at the city morgue by his father the next day. Wrapped in a blue tartan picnic blanket and tucked into a ledge, he was tied with string, had been gagged with a scarf and the poor little boy was still wearing his school uniform. The blanket containing the body had been there for some time. Two local children had known about it, but the discovery was only made when mentioned to their parents around 7pm that day. With the forensic examination, police found a few clues and used this evidence to start a search to find the perpetrator. And then following a tip off from a postman, A house was identified in the suburb of Clontarf, 1.5 kilometre from where Graham's body was found. Police visited the house on Monday 3rd of October and learned it had been occupied by a Hungarian immigrant named Stephen Bradley. Bradley had also owned a blue Ford Custom Line and had a Pekingese as a family pet and his wife had dyed blonde hair. However, Bradley and his family had vacated the house on the 7th of July for a rented flat in another suburb in Manly and had left Australia for London with his family a week earlier on the 26th of September aboard the SS Himalaya. When the Himalaya docked at Colombo Salon, he was Bradley was greeted by two Sydney policemen. After several weeks was extradited to Australia on the 18th of November 1960, allegedly making a confession on the plane before it landed back in Australia. In court, Bradley tried to plead not guilty to murder, but was identified as the man seen by witnesses, including Frieda Thorne. He then admitted the kidnapping, 
providing details of how he posed as a driver and fabricated a tale to persuade Graham into his car that day. Bradley never showed remorse for the crime and he was eventually sentenced to life imprisonment, the maximum penalty provided in New South Wales for murder. After this horrible tragedy, the lottery procedures in Australia was changed, with winners being given the option of remaining anonymous. And this is the poor young boy here. Excuse me, this work out there. Um, such a tragedy. Only eight years old. And um, it's a horror that many people would never forget. I remember hearing about it growing up and um, just imagining, you know, the elation and then the horror of what happened. He's resting in peace with his mother. Innocent life taken. All I can hope is that they're both resting in peace. Well, I hope you enjoyed the tragic story of Paul Graham. Um, if you'd like to watch more videos of mine on cemeteries down under, please consider subscribing um, and leave a comment below and a like. YouTube likes that. And, um, I'm going to leave you here. I've got a bit of a heavy heart. Um, it's always sad to talk about children and I almost didn't do this story because it was a little bit too sad but um, I wanted to share it with um, people that hadn't heard about his story before. So I'll catch you next time. Bye for now.